But once again, no disclosures. So syndesmotic injuries are often injured in conjunction with ankle fractures. Pure syndesmotic injuries we refer to as high ankle sprains typically. They can be subtle or severe, stable or unstable. They comprise approximately 12% of all ankle sprains, depending on what study you read. They may be much more rare. Uh, but in collision sports, there are probably about 25% of the ankle sprains we see. The recovery time can be highly variable, as many of you in the room know. They can be very frustrating for the player, for the trainer, for the coach, for the doctor. <clears throat> Our clinical questions. What is the best diagnostic exam or test for high ankle sprains? What's the average time to return to play? And which patient should be considered for operative treatment of high ankle sprains? To show the anatomy, sometimes people think there's only three ligaments, perhaps, comprising the syndesmosis. Depending on uh, how you parse it out, there is the anterior inferior uh, uh, tibiofibular ligament, is the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, there is the interosseous membrane, the inferior uh, part of which is the interosseous ligament, and then there is the lesser known inverse transverse tib fib ligament inferior to the PITFL. Not to be forgotten is the deltoid ligament, which does play a role in ankle and syndesmotic uh, stability, but is not part of the syndesmosis. So the mechanism, many of us are well aware that it, it is most commonly a dorsiflexion external rotation mechanism. You can uh, distinguish this. Uh, your patients will tell you how their ankle is positioned, and that will clue you in as to what we have to do here. It's common in collision sports. It's often a planted foot that is forcibly externally rotated or landed on. When they're landed on, the, the tibia necessarily internally rotates. Uh, it can be a contested soccer ball kick. Other mechanisms, such as a hyper dorsiflexion mechanism, have been described. Even a hyper inversion, which typically would cause the uh, lateral ankle sprain, which is almost always an inversion injury. Here we see Ben Roethlisberger on the left. Uh, being landed upon, his foot is externally rotated, his tibia is being internally rotated. There's dorsi a dorsiflexion component, uh, much different than the high-heeled uh, lateral ankle sprain. I don't think this lady was doing squats, though. Um, so the diagnosis, the mechanism is very important. Once again, fall on your history. Um, that will give you most of the answers you need to know. A uh, patient uh, will complain of anterolateral pain, oftentimes proximal to really the ankle. Sometimes they are complaining of posterior medial pain as well. Uh, however, ecchymosis, swelling, uh, can be less impressive than some of our more typical ankle sprains. So they may not be that swollen, they may not have a lot of ecchymosis, but they can. There are several provocative maneuvers we like to use. Uh, the squeeze test, the dorsiflexion external rotation test, also called a Klieger test. This is as opposed to the inversion test that we use for a lateral ankle sprain. Where are they tender? And how proximal does it go? There's also the cross-legged test and a single leg hop test. So here we see, uh, typically I would do this with the patient uh, sitting upright and the knee flexed over the edge of the examining table. But either way, you're squeezing the uh, tibia and fibula together at about the mid leg. And if that causes pain more distally, that may indicate that you're uh, causing a compensatory uh, widening of the syndesmosis where the injury is. So squeeze in the middle of the leg, Pain at the syndesmosis by the ankle, that's a positive squeeze test. This is the cross leg maneuver. Patient uh, crosses their injured leg over the well knee. They push down with their hands on the knee and that necessarily causes a external rotation force at the ankle. <clears throat> that causes pain at the syndesmosis that may indicate a high ankle sprain. One of the most commonly used ones, this is the Klieger test or the dorsiflexion external rotation maneuver. You stabilize the tibia and dorsiflex and externally rotate the ankle. Pain there, high ankle sprain. Tenderness, uh, these structures are relatively far apart. So uh, certainly in the acute injury, you can distinguish whether they are tender in their typical spot with a lateral ankle sprain, the ATFL, or whether it's more proximal above the ankle joint up into the distal leg. That would be your high ankle sprain. And then uh, single leg hops. Uh, if they cannot do a single leg hop, you have to be very suspicious of a uh, high ankle sprain, whereas a lateral ankle sprain actually can do a single leg hop. They may not want to do it, but if you ask them to do it, they can go up on their toes and they can get a, a couple hops in. <clears throat> However, 
Um, as far as the evidence goes in the literature, the evidence is poor. Um, this was described uh, in 2013. There was a meta-analysis done. Uh, the overall uh, accuracy of these tests is not very good. In combination, uh, they may be better, but again, the evidence is not great. So imaging is very important. If you suspect a high ankle sprain, we need to know if it is a unstable or a stable high ankle sprain because that changes our management. So on the left, this is a normal ankle, and what we're looking at is the uh, area here in the syndesmosis. This is the what's considered the tib-fib clear space. You need to know how wide that is. We're also looking at the overall architecture of that joint and the medial joint space here where your deltoid would be. We'd like to know how wide that is. In the middle, middle uh, picture, this is a, a bimalleolar equivalent ankle fracture. The fibula has been fractured. Uh, the syndesmosis has been disrupted. There is obviously widening at the medial clear space. There's widening between the tibia and fibula. This is obviously uh, an injury that has occurred to the syndesmosis. But more subtle would be this picture on the right. No fracture, <clears throat> but if you look carefully, there is space right between the uh, tibia and fibula. And the uh, medial clear space is... Uh, open as well. That's an unstable, pure syndesmotic injury. We do measure these spaces. So again, you have your medial clear space here. Uh, we like to see that less than four millimeters. We also like to see it look about the same as the space above the talus, the tibial talar space. You have your tib, tib fib clear space, the yellow line here. We like to see that less than six millimeters. If that's wider, you have an injury in that syndesmosis. And then there's tib-fib overlap, which is a little harder to see, but you have your tibia in front here, you have your fibula in the back, and we measure that overlap. If there's a disruption in the relationship between the tibia and fibula, then that overlap is going to change. <clears throat> It'll become less. Uh, just like everything else in orthopedics, you should never have just one x-ray. One x-ray is not sufficient in just about anything we do. You need at least an AP and a lateral. In the ankle, we get three views. We get the, uh, the AP, the mortise view, and the lateral view. Again, just to review where our structures are, we're looking at that tib-fib clear space there. That is where our syndesmosis lives. So your neighbor comes over to you and they bring their disc because they went to the ER, they, they uh, injured their ankle uh, playing softball and the, the uh, urgent care said that there, there was no fracture, they sprained their ankle. And they bring the disc over to you because you're a healthcare provider and you see this. <clears throat> and now you know that this is not normal. Sure, there's no fracture, but this is not normal. You have a very wide space here in the medial clear space and you also have widening at the syndesmosis here. So that's a different animal. This one needs surgery compared to your ankle sprain, which you're going to let them start uh, walking on as soon as they feel ready. We can measure those distances. <clears throat> Not to forget, they can actually have a fracture. Sometimes uh, patients uh, will have what's called a Masonuve injury. The energy from the ankle injury, where's my mouth? will be transferred from the ankle all the way up through the interosseous membrane and exit out by the proximal fibula. So, so someone comes in with a knee x-ray and they have this fracture by their fibula, uh, you really need to ask them, how's your ankle feeling? Because they may have a syndesmotic injury down by the ankle. There's no fracture down by the ankle, but what needs to be treated is the ankle injury, not the fibula up top. We don't treat that surgically. MRIs can be obtained. Um, they show, in this case, a lot of edema, which is the white signal. The uh, anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament should be seen here, a black line, but it's not seen here. This is an injury to the anterior aspect of the syndesmosis. The posterior aspect is right here, this black line. That's your posterior syndesmosis. That's intact, but you do see bone bruises there. <clears throat> should we be getting MRIs? A level 4 study uh, in 2012, not the best level of evidence, but it did give us some decent information. These were NFL players who had suspected high ankle sprains. Uh, some interesting information, nobody was able to return to play that day. That's usually the case. If they have a high ankle sprain, they can't get back, whereas if they had a lateral ankle sprain, perhaps they can. <clears throat> Average time lost, they do lose a lot of time. 17 practices, approximately 3 games. In this study, the dorsiflexion external rotation test and the squeeze test were uh, found to be 
the best tests with the dorsiflexion external, the Klieger test, 83% sensitive. <clears throat> However, if they had a positive squeeze test and if they had a, a significant amount of tenderness up the leg, more proximally, that was correlated with a longer return to play. And they described on the MRIs how if the uh, posterior syndesmosis is involved, if you see a tear or signal in the back of the ankle, that's a worse injury. Um, it's never seen in isolation, and that's a longer return to play. <clears throat> so this brings us back to Taylor's study way back in 1992 when high ankle sprains were still being uh, described. This is a college football player study, level four study also. Their average return to play was 31 days. That's about half the season. <clears throat> so, and when they did return to play, um, all players had pain and stiffness, and they often have difficulty with push-off strength. Uh, in addition, so somewhat surprisingly, um, four years later, some patients still had mild to moderate symptoms, perhaps because they didn't use the protocol that we use nowadays, which is to get them off their feet, get them on crutches, get them in the boot right away once you diagnose it to allow this to recover uh, early on. Uh, the grading of the injury is important because the coach and the trainer and everyone else wants to know when can these players return to play. How do we figure that out? Well, Eric Nussbaum performed an, uh, a very nice study and something that is widely quoted in the literature in, in terms of describing the tenderness length. <clears throat> this is uh, Eric's old enough to uh, have been doing research back before we really did levels of evidence. So it wasn't given a grade, but I graded it as a three. We didn't have a control group, but it was a very good study. Um, and they documented the tenderness length, meaning from the tip of the fibula, proximally, how tender is that patient anteriorly about the syndesmosis. You measure this in centimeters, you can get a ballpark figure as to when that patient is going to be able to return to play. Um, I, I, I simplified the equation a little bit, but it's tenderness length in centimeters plus five is the amount of days when you can return to play, plus or minus 3.7 days. <clears throat> As far as grading, we tend to grade them mild, moderate, or unst mild, stable, moderate, unstable with stress views, and unstable uh, would be grade three, uh, which is uh, a statically unstable, uh, similar to that x-ray I showed you. Importantly, MRI grading has not been proven to be a, a good barometer for when patients can return to play necessarily. The proximal extent of the edema does not necessarily correlate. So when do we order an MRI then? If the diagnosis is in question, as it sometimes can be, <clears throat> if there's concern over an osteochondral defect, perhaps on your radiographs you saw an abnormality in the talus, you need to know because those patients aren't going to get better with the typical high ankle sprain uh, protocol. Patients who aren't getting better in the expected amount of time, um, I would order an MRI. Um, if they have a really severe presentation um, and yet stable on stress views, um, I would consider an MRI as well. This can just help give you a gauge as to how bad is this injury. Maybe we really do have to uh, slow this down a little bit. Um, but of course, it comes down to patient and parent demands. Oftentimes, they see a, a very uh, painful or, or a slow to recover ankle. They want an MRI. And also, are they in season? Is there an upcoming season? Is there a scholarship uh, in, in, that's uh, in the balance here? It can give you some information to help guide you. So what's our treatment? So for mild high ankle sprains, and I use that term loosely because it can be mild but can still be a prolonged recovery. Um, what I mean by mild is it's clinically and radiographically stable. On the x-ray, there's no widening of the syndesmosis, even if you stress the view under x-rays. This, we typically will utilize the non-operative protocol, which I'll get to in a minute. A moderate, or grade two, means that on stress views, like this picture on the right, you see the examiner's hand holding the tibia and, and the foot's being externally rotated. Uh, that syndesmosis is, is wide open. That, uh, in my hands, that needs surgery. You can fix that with a screw or with a suspensory device. Um, you can treat that non-operatively, but most of us would not uh, treat it that way. And then if it's a severe uh, injury, grade three, where it doesn't require a stress view to show this uh, widening or this in instability, those uh, are an automatic for surgery. So the non-op protocol, this too is based off of some of uh, Eric's research. Uh, and it's a protocol that, uh, ironically, I was using before I uh, even knew, knew Eric. I was out west, and uh, this was the protocol that uh, we utilized at the uh, University of Colorado and came to learn that uh, he was a colleague and friend uh, years later. 
But uh, grade one injuries, um, you, it's good to put them in a boot right away. If you have a boot uh, in your locker room, in your trainer room, um, that's great because that's what we like to do with these. And we also want to put them on crutches. Don't let them limp around Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then get to the doctor on, on Monday. Um, if you think they have a syndesmotic injury, lock them up early on in the boot, get them off their feet, and that's going to accelerate the recovery um, a week or two down the road. However, we do start early range of motion, so it's not a cast. Um, four or five days later, we start partial weight bearing, we get rid of the boot, and we put them in a brace, a um, little bit different than the lateral ankle braces. This is almost an AFO brace. This is the, the Don Joy Velocity, but there's a lot of braces out there. Um, and hopefully, by, by the end of a week, uh, they are full weight bearing. Um, they're performing more functional PT with hopping and cutting um, and getting back to play uh, when they can do 10 single leg hops. We do put them back to play in this brace. What if they need surgery? There's a couple of options, one of which is putting a screw or two through the syndesmosis from fibula to tibia. <clears throat> Another, a little bit more uh, newer technology is using a suspensory device. These are buttons, these are metal buttons, and in between they have a very strong suture that can hold the tibia and fibula uh, together as the ligament heals. Why would we do that? The screw seems more uh, secure and more rigid than a suture. Well, uh, a rigid screw probably doesn't allow the normal dynamic relationship between the tibia and fibula. There is motion there. There is supposed to be motion there. And we have learned, uh, certainly with MCL injuries, that motion is good for ligament injuries. We don't want to put an MCL injury in the knee in a cast, right? We would never do that. So why would we lock up uh, a ligament injury around the ankle? So early range of motion uh, it may be beneficial, and the suspensory device theoretically allows that. In addition, uh, typically people will remove these screws because as you see here, these two are broken. Um, if you uh, put a screw through this dynamic relationship, over time these screws loosen or break. That's not the end of the world, that's okay, they may not notice that, but people often don't like that concept, so we remove those screws as a second surgery. If you do this button that doesn't have to be removed, maybe you don't have to have a second surgery. Uh, this has been uh, studied. There's a systematic review um, which showed uh, uh, similar outcomes between a screw and suspensory fixation. Um, interesting that there was not a zero rate of implant removal. These implants, the suspensory device, can bother you. The knots from the sutures can cause some irritation. Of course, you can get an infection, so sometimes uh, uh, you do have to remove them, but not as frequently as screws. Um, some researchers have suggested that suspensory fixation will allow an earlier or better uh, return to play. That has not been fully borne out in the literature, although they're trying. So this is a level two study uh, from a couple of years ago. Um, this was ankle fractures. So this is not isolated syndesmotic injuries, but this is ankle fractures that required surgery uh, for the broken fibula typically. And then in addition, they had a syndesmotic injury that was given what's called a tightrope. That is one of the devices that uh, uh, you can use. You see that here. Um, they're allowed to weight bear at six weeks. Um, they trended towards a faster recovery and better ankle uh, scores in the suspensory uh, device group versus the screw um, the static screw group, but this was not statistically significant. <clears throat> it was interesting that when the screws were removed, uh, uh, a few patients showed a loss of reduction of their syndesmosis. And this is something that we see in the trauma literature. Uh, people often f don't feel quite right when the screw is in. They actually can feel better when we remove the screw. Their ankle feels less tight. Um, this is a controversial topic, but uh, it is true that you can over-reduce or mal-reduce the syndesmosis and the screw won't allow it to assume a normal position, whereas you could theorize that the suspensory device is, has a little more wiggle room and the fibula can go where it wants to when you fix it. Um, still a matter of debate. These folks thought tightrope was a better clinical and radiographic, uh, showed better clinical and radiographic outcomes with fewer reoperations. Of note, this was a study supported by uh, arthrex, so there is some bias there. Ankle arthroscopy is an option. Some people jump to that immediately when they have a, a suspected high ankle sprain. It can help you diagnose it, uh, and uh, if it's unstable enough, if there's enough damage, you can debride what is a torn syndesmosis here compared to the normal side, um, and then you can uh, perform your fixation. So when do people return to play after surgery? Classically, it was a very long recovery as many as 12 weeks before people were allowed to weight bear. 
uh, and then the screws were typically removed uh, at around the 16 week mark. This is a prolonged recovery that's out there in some of the literature. Perhaps it's a little faster than, than that. People are sometimes allowed to return to play closer to, to 12 or 14 weeks. Uh, Taylor was at West Point, performed a small six patients level four study. They tried to get people back to play very early in season. They had grade three high ankle sprains and they were fixed with screws and they were allowed to uh, weight bear early two weeks and return to play uh, somewhere around uh, six weeks. Um, they were happy with their results. It was only six patients. Uh, they took the screws out at the end of the season. There is fear that if you get these people back too early, the syndesmosis doesn't heal and the screws are going to break. So suspensory fixation theoretically would allow you to weight bear earlier without fear of hardware breakage. This was studied uh, this year, um, a 2000 and, uh, sorry, obviously this year, level four study. A few more patients, 18. These are all low numbers of patients. So these aren't great studies. Um, uh, what they do in this, in this study is they get people weight bearing pretty early on the Alter G, 50% weight bearing at like four weeks, and they were able to get people back to play uh, at about 60 days. So it's not really fast, but it's faster than some of the quoted literature. So what are the outcomes or consequences of high ankle sprains? Um, most, most athletes do return to their sport, but the timing of that is very, very variable, as I think many of you know. Um, if you return to play too early, if you don't restrict their motion early on, uh, sorry, restrict their weight bearing early on, um, then it's, there's a higher rate of recurrence. Um, there can be ossification of the syndesmosis. We see this on x-rays. The, uh, the, the implications of that are not fully clear. Uh, chronic pain is common. Loss of power and push-off strength is definitely something that patients will complain of. Um, they are at risk for post-traumatic arthrosis or arthritis. But in summary, it's a frustrating injury with a highly uh, variable return to play. The uh, levels of evidence are poor in the literature. As opposed to, say, the Achilles tendon rupture data, uh, the levels of evidence for high ankle sprains are not good. They don't, uh, it's hard to make your decisions based on this, this literature. Um, but it appears that if you have two or more uh, positive clinical exam findings, such as syndesmosis tenderness, a positive Klieger test, a positive squeeze test, and many would say, most importantly, difficulty with single leg hops, then you have a high ankle sprain. Uh, the more unstable ones require fixation. Suspensory devices uh, appear to be at least as effective uh, are they better? Do they require less uh, need for removal? Uh, maybe. So what's the best diagnostic exam or test? This has not been proven in the literature. Um, most of us hang our hat on the dorsiflexion external rotation test and syndesmotic tenderness. Um, it's important to measure the length of that tenderness to help you determine uh, when they can return to play. Uh, the more proximal it goes up the leg, the longer it's going to be. <clears throat> um, which patients should be considered for fixation? Certainly those with any radiographic instability. There is a, a, a group of uh, thought out there that fixing some of the stable ones could potentially allow these athletes to get back on the field earlier. Um, that too has not been borne out in the literature, but that's a, a matter of uh, discussion. Give Eric a beer and an hour and you'll learn a lot. <laughs> Thank you.